All right, so as we begin to wrap up chapter 10 on development, we want to look today at ways to finance development in a country. So in the first video, we talked about, you know, what does development mean? How do we measure that? Um, we also looked at that also with measuring inequality and gender inequality in another video. And then we also looked in the, in the very previous video um, about, you know, how do we actually develop it either via the self-sufficiency model, similar to what was done in India, as the book describes, or through the international trade model, with the, also known as the Rostow model. So for this today, we're looking at just describing the types of financial development um, and evaluating kind of how that works um, and, you know, international development institutions and kind of, again, pros and cons limitations of that. So financing development. So in order to, you know, build an economy, build economic structures, build infrastructure, um, it all costs money. All right. So, well, how do you get that? So in all cases, you know, where does, you know, money for starting a business, road, electrical grid, internet, um, where would it come in the self-sufficiency model? How, where would it come from in the international trade? So those are things to consider. Um, and so for the most part, however, within self-sufficiency, it's, you know, local loan agencies. It could be from the government through government investments or government taxes to build these things. Um, so typically, again, you can think about, you know, if you know, if you're familiar with the New Deal, um, you know, government building like the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, which is a massive um, series of dams and electrical grids that were built throughout, again, the Tennessee Valley during the 1930s. Um, or again, it could just be people who have money that want to invest in, you know, in businesses and they want to make money. So that's through the self-sufficiency model. Um, within the international trade model, you have, you can go, again, you can go through local banks, you can go through government investment and taxes. But in most cases with international trade, foreign direct investment comes from transnational corporations. All right. So think about, you know, um, you know, a lot of different uh, international banks, okay, like Deutsche Bank, um, you know, U.S. Bank um, would be kind of those kind of examples. Otherwise, you know, other companies could invest as well. Um, and most are from, again, the developed or M more, more developed countries and invest in other M more developed countries, as we'll see, as well as some less developed countries, too, um, but not to the same level. Um, you can also get it from banks and different governments and also micro loans. So getting it from individuals or, you know, nonprofits to invest in other individual businesses or nonprofits. And we'll look at some of those. Um, or we could, you know, see money given from governments related to stabilizing currencies, um, giving money out for government reforms, um, supporting major, you know, industry makers, job makers, money makers, or infrastructure projects. So again, um, it could be, again, local governments, local banks, but again, a lot of it comes from foreign companies and foreign banks when we talk about the international trade piece, okay? So some of the quick institutions, and again, the book talks more about these in depth, and that's why I'm not really going to go too in depth with them here. Um, the World Bank um, lends money for specific projects within countries. The International Monetary Fund uh, lends money for general purposes, so not specific projects. So it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, we're kind of struggling here. Can we get investment? You know, the International Monetary Fund would give it out for more general purposes while the World Bank would say, no, it's got to be like specifically for building of an electrical grid or building up of a road or um, you have to spend this money on, you know, um, gender equity or something like that. They would like be very, very targeted with the World Bank. IMF is kind of more, okay, well, you kind of said you're going to do a few things here with it. You know, here's the money and just kind of go for it. All right. And the key here is that it's lending money. So the money is expected to be given back. All right. And then we get another organization here known as the World Trade Organization or WTO. Um, and that's pretty much designed to get rid of tariffs or limit their limit tariffs or their effectiveness um, and also limited government subsidies. So when we mean by government subsidies, when the government is giving money out to an industry or a business um, to allow it to um, get stronger or to help recover faster in terms of economic hardship or to develop said industry. So that's like something giving like tax incentives. So, um, you know, helping to build that one part of the economy or that certain business. Um, and so they do these to um, limit trade restrictions between countries and also enforce trade agreements. So something like NAFTA or, you know, NAFTA 2, which is kind of what would be, came up with the Trump administration between, um, you know, uh, the United States, Canada and Mexico uh, in terms of, you know, pretty much free trade amongst us would be a, the WTO would enforce that. Um, they would enforce that agreement and make sure as an international organization that every country that's involved would hold up their end of the bargain. And if not, that's kind of like the arbitrary court or arbitration court that would decide, you know, who's at fault and who needs to fix things and what would the punishment be. Um, so the EU would be kind of another example here of the idea of limiting, again, tariffs because it's another supranational organization where it was uh, designed for. Um, so, yeah. Now, the problem is 
that when countries are asking for loans and they go into further debt and are not able to repay it, what happens? So that's where this comes from it, and this is where the WTO gets a lot of negative flack because of the fact that typically these countries are typically more developed, or sorry, are the developing or less developed countries, so more, again, your peripheral, semi-peripheral countries that need more of that aid, especially coming from foreign governments, um, and when they're not able to meet those um, benchmarks of repaying loans or for, in terms of actually, you know, getting farther along in the progression, um, they have to adjust or reform their economy as dictated by the World Trade Organization and sometimes other governments, including, or to, in, turn, in turn to get more money, more resources, more aid, um, and they're told where they have to spend their money and where they have to spend their resources. So this could focus them instead of, you know, trying to build up other sectors of the economy, they might say, well, no, I mean, you're really only good at producing this one, one or two items, so you have to focus on that because um, that's where we consider you to be the most competitive globally. So that's where a lot of these uh, countries might struggle and say, well, we don't want to just grow bananas, but essentially you're telling us to repay our loans. We have to essentially grow bananas or we have to um, deflate our currency value in order to get more loans or we have to um, allow these businesses in and not tax them very high again to get more aid, more support. And that's where a lot of the negativity comes from. And you can Google that and find more specific ones. I'm talking very general here. All right. Um, and so typically the taxes from the stuff that they are getting from their products that they're making um, and, and selling should be used to pay for those loans and investments coming from, again, the IMF, the World Bank, or other countries in the World Trade Organization. All right. So in terms of foreign direct investment, you can kind of see this. Um, this is based on 2018 data. All right. So just a few years old. So pretty recent. Um, and you can see that most of the money is staying predominantly within a lot of the, again, developed, the more core countries. Um, so the United States, you can see the Netherlands up there, a lot of Europe, okay, um, Israel in there, Singapore, um, South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, um, even though Hong Kong is technically now part of, or is be part of China, they consider themselves kind of a little more separate entity, but that's a different issue of sovereignty. Um, and you can see some levels of development in kind of more of those periphery and semi-periphery countries. So again, a lot of Latin America, okay, um, China, India, Bangladesh, um, and then parts of Africa. So in this any country that doesn't get a billion dollars from foreign direct investment um, is not listed on the map. And so obviously you can kind of see where size gets skewed here based on those numbers. So hence why the Netherlands looks really, really big in comparison to its actual size. Same thing with Luxembourg. Um, you know, Luxembourg is a very, very tiny country. Um, and yet on this map, it's bigger than Russia. It's bigger than um, the Ukraine comparatively. Well, you don't see a lot of countries actually within, again, Central Asia, Okay, you're missing places like Azerbaijan. Uh, well, it's not, never mind, there's Azerbaijan. But you're missing a lot of a countries within Africa. All right, you can think about the Cayman Islands and offshore banking there. Um, so yeah, this is a website, pretty fun. Um, pretty good if you're interested in doing microloans, helping out people around the globe, including also here in the United States. Um, looking for nonprofit uh, loans. And again, that's something to look into about the idea of microloans and financing. Uh, to help out people who don't necessarily find those other channels. And this is kind of, again, more for um, people who just want to help others, um, you know, essentially build their business and make a better life for themselves. So then coming down to one of the last topics here is when we hit hard economic times, what's the best way to stimulate or help the economy? So we have, uh, maybe stimulate wasn't the right word I wanted to use here because it might fit in very, very well here. Um, so how do we fight economic downturns? So when, you know, we're in the midst of a recession or a global pandemic, what should the government be doing? Should it do anything? Or should it be limited? Should it be more involved? So the first one here is what we call the stimulus strategy. And that is the idea that the government should spend more of its money than it collects. So spending more money than it takes in um, and help put people to work, um, like the idea of the New Deal in the 1930s or... You know, now here in 2020, 2021, um, amidst the global pandemic, um, you know, where the government has, you know, shelled out, you know, uh, those stimulus packages, you know, what was it like initially like, what, $1,200 um, per person, and then the last one was like around a 600 now they're talking about doing 1400 per person or something to that, that amount, um, and the belief is that we'll be able to repay that once we're out of a recession, once we're out of the hard economic times. Um, because, you know, we'll be able to, the economy will bounce back, we'll make the money back in taxes, so that will replenish kind of the money that we were spending. 
Um, so the idea is to stimulate the economy with government funds. The other idea is more what we call the austerity strategy. So rather than the government spending more and more money, it would rather be let's cut back on taxes so that way instead of giving somebody $1,000 with government money, if we cut everyone's taxes by let's say $1,000, then they already have that money and they'll be willing to more spend that elsewhere. All right, um, That would help the economy recover later on. And so that's kind of the big debate, you know, in many countries itself. But if you take it here in the United States, the stimulus strategy would be more favored by liberals and Democrats, while the austerity strategy more by Republicans and conservatives. So something to consider to talk about. And, you know, the book will talk about how well each kind of one of those works. Um, so then the last thing to really bring it back to here is fair trade. So this ties into, you know, helping out people again in developing countries. Um, to protect workers and small businesses, um, because again, with a lot of the global trade, they're the ones in, um, again, those developing countries who are hurt the most, typically, again, overworked, underpaid, um, and their economies aren't being built, their standards of living aren't improving to the rate that we would like. So what do we do? Well, fair trade practices are meant to essentially will pay more for the goods, but the benefits will help those in those developing countries earn a better life, get a better standard of living, and increase their human development index. All right, um, Because there's a large benefit to producers, workers, and consumers as standards are considered to be higher. So we're paying a little more to make things better for themselves and for us. So in terms of producing, okay, we want to ensure that the person producing the good um, makes more money, but again, that comes with we have to pay more for said product. Um, Typically, that means cutting out a middleman, okay, a merchant or a trader kind of in the middle who would um, take the product and, you know, they wouldn't produce it, but they would sell it to the next person to sell it to a bigger market. Um, so that way, again, more of that money goes into the hands of the producer rather than them losing money kind of in the middle, right? Um, another kind of example of a producer standard would be going back to agriculture with the use of organic foods instead of GMOs and pesticides. Okay, worker standards would include making more protections for workers. So again, that would include... Um, ending child labor, so that ties into, again, um, you know, the issues going on with, you know, the Nestle and the Hershey's people, um, essentially on their, you know, cocoa farms. Um, to also talking about increasing wages, better safety, better working hours or safer working hours, more rights to unions. Um, within, again, that idea of making things more fair, more equitable. And then you have higher standards, which, again, you can reinvest and get more and more money within that for those people. And then better consumer standards. So that includes, you know, having cooperative stores that are owned locally um, and controlled by essentially community members rather than a large corporation that may not have strong ties to the community other than hiring people to work in said store. All right. Um, so you can kind of think here a bunch of co-ops that exist. And so, again, that's kind of a very basic overview of the fair trade piece. Um then the book also mentions the um, UN, the UN development or sustainable development goals. Be familiar with some of those and how they tie into what we've talked about um, so far um, within the ideas again of development and trade. So and then some more fair trade in Minnesota connections with agriculture. So that's where we're going to wrap up chapter ten, and then we'll move on to chapter eleven and industry and manufacturing.